Keep on silent and uh, not to kill your laptops from the desks. Uh, who cares about what a uh, room coordinator has to say about the speaker? It's quite obvious a lot of people care about uh, Debian, so I'll hand over straight away to Stefan. Will you join me in welcoming him? So thanks everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Australia and my first time at LCA. And I must say, I'm really much enjoying the conference. So the kind of teasing title of this talk is because there are so quite some uh, rumors about Debian and the role of the, which Debian is playing in today's ecosystem. And my answer to that question is that you should care about Debian because uh, quite some parts of today's free software ecosystem depends on Debian, even if you not necessarily know about that. So I'm trying you to convince you of this thesis. Clearly, I'm a bit biased on this topic, being the Debian project leader, but I'll try very hard to hide that fact from you during the talk. So, uh, to speak about Debian is often useful to start from the beginning. So there are a couple of historic facts which are relevant to this discussion. So let's start from um, how Debian started. So the small paragraph of text you see at the top of this slide is actually the message that Ian Marduk the founder of Debian sent to a news group, back then we used heavily news group to communicate, called CompUS Linux Development. And in that message, Ian was announcing the imminent completion of a new Debian, of a new um, Linux release called Debian. So uh, I think it was a bit optimistic because we nowadays know that free software distribution are essentially never complete. So 17 years later, Debian is not yet complete and will never be, so Ian was defined a bit optimistic back, back then. But in that message, you could find um, some of the main reasons for creating Debian and for having Debian around. So one of the first reasons, one of the first motives to have Debian back then was to create a non-commercial distro, but which was still able to compete in the commercial OS market. So that was the, the prime motive to run Debian, to create Debian, sorry. And Ian wanted to have something easy to install. Of course, the criteria for being easy to install back then are not quite the same we have today. So I don't think Ian was thinking back then to have a CD put in, a, in a, your reader and t t 10 minutes later have a system installed. I don't think he was thinking of that back then. Uh, and another point for him was to actually have a system which was built collaboratively. And collaboratively by a group of experts which were expert in every single package they were putting in the distribution. So the idea was that if you're maintaining a package, well, then you know a lot about it and you are an expert of the software you are delivering to your users. And finally, uh, one other, another criteria for creating Debian with then, back then was to actually have the first major distribution, which was actually run in an open manner in the spirit of the GNU project. And actually Debian has been GNU supported for a while in its early existence. So this is how all it started. And then there are uh, two more important events in the history of Debian which are relevant for this discussion. So the first one is the creation of the Debian social contract in 1997. So this social contract is an agreement uh, between the people who make Debian, so Debian developers in general, and not only Debian users, but the free software community at large. And in that contract, you find uh, four main points. So the first one is a commitment of having Debian as a purely 100% free operating system. The second one is a commitment to give back to the free software community, meaning that every change you do in Debian, well, you commit yourself to giving it back to the upstream author so that everyone can benefit from the change you have made in Debian. Then there is the spirit of, being, of openness, which Debian has been enjoying since the beginning, which is uh, defined as don't hide problems. And finally, the, the document defines the priority of Debian, which are essentially true. So free software on one side and users on the other side. So this kind of document, the social contract, is still in effect, and it's what uh, binds together people who makes Debian and user of Debian. And the other important point in Debian history, which is relevant for, for us today, is the Debian constitution, which has been uh, created for the first time in 1998. And what the document is, is essentially a set of structures and rules to govern a free software compatible democracy. So why I say free software compatible? Well, because we don't really have to go through the burden of voting on every single change. We want, we want to enable people to work as they like in open source and free software and do whatever they want, unless at some point the community to feel the need of voting on something. So that is what the Debian constitution enabled people to do. So there you find uh, uh, decision uh, procedures 
and I'll get back to that shortly, you will find how democracy is used in Debian, and you will find some scaffolding like the Debian project leader or the secretary to actually run votes. So this is in starting from 1993 up to now, and 17 years later, the landscape is a bit different. So we now have in Debian something like 30,000 binary packages. It's probably the largest free software distribution existing today. And in 17 years, we have released 11 times. And the 12 times Debian Squeeze is going to be released, most likely, next in the weekend of 5 and 6 of February. Um, the project has been growing a lot. So we are now today 900 Debian developers, 100 Debian maintainers, which are a different technical role in the project, plus thousands of contributors like porters, translators, bug triager, and so on and so forth. And we also have in Debian the largest number of ports among uh, mainstream Linux distribution. So we had 12 for uh, Debian Lenny. And starting with Debian Squeeze, you're going to have two for the first time, two non-Linux ports. So we're going to have two ports based on the FreeBSD kernel, blended with a GNU um, user land. And finally, we have had in all these years something like 120 other distributions which have based their work on Debian. And well, if you ask me, this is a pretty good success. <laughs> so it's quite impressive considering where Debian started from. Nonetheless, uh, the landscape has completely changed. So back then, there were like two, three Linux distribution. And today, there are kind of hundreds of them. So if you look at SourceForge, you find hundreds and hundreds of GNU Linux distributions. And Debian is just one of them. So there are many. So why should one choose Debian? Why should one care about Debian in the first place? Especially considering that some of those other distributions have very nice features. For instance, some, some of them are released more frequently, like every six months. Some of them have more users. Some of them uh, innovate more, whatever that means. Some of them get more credit, press, you find uh, news about them in the newspaper, and this kind of stuff. Or whatever other food you might, FUD you might have about Debian, add it to that list. So the question is, who the bloody hell cares about Debian anymore? OK, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and more importantly, <laughs> oh, come on, go to another talk then. You're useless here. <laughs> so is Debian still relevant? And yes, it is. I think it is, but I don't want you to take my word for that. I want to explain why it is the case. So there are two main arguments for that. The first one is that Debian does it better. There are some features which you find in Debian and which you won't find altogether in many other distributions, possibly none at all, not at all. So the first one, there are four of them. The first one, in my opinion, is package quality. So Debian has a focus on the quality of every single package in the archive. So I like to call it a culture of technical excellence, which, is, uh, which appears in various forms. So for instance, we have a clear definition in a rigorous document called the Debian policy of how a package should look, look like. So in that document, you find definition of where any single file you might want to ship in a package should be installed. For instance, where you should put documentation, where you should put images, where you should put other kind of artworks. And this is gives to users a, um, a sense of consistency through all, all the operating system, which is quality. Um, a second form of this quality you can find in Debian is an extensive package testing. So every package is run through a set of an automatic tester called Linkian, which actually checks whether your package adheres or not to the policy. And then we do a lot of other testing, like uh, stress testing of package installation. So periodically, we test all the package in the archive to see if you can install or not install in all possible con situation, trying to ensure that you will always be able to install a package provided its dependency are satisfied. And then we have periodic mass rebuild of all the packages in the archive. So in every single stable release of Debian, you have the guarantee that uh, every single package in the archive can be rebuilt from scratch using the other packages in the archive. And this is more important than one might think. Because what is the point of free software if the ability to change it and rebuild your own package is just theoretical? So unless you can really change a package and have the ability to rebuild it, well, then you have free software in some way, but you cannot really enjoy the benefit of it. So for us, this is a very important quality point. And then uh, we still have the uh, criteria that 
a package maintainer or a team of people maintaining a package are generally expert in the package they maintain. That means that when you ask questions about the package, you can um, interact with people which know the details of the software and not only details of packaging. Imagine scientific software, for instance. It makes quite a hell of a difference if you can interact with someone who knows what you're talking about and not only just how to package software. Uh, finally, all packages in the Debian archive are equal. So there is no distinction about first class and second class packages. So the kind of support you get for a Debian package is the same no matter what the package is. Okay? And all this is summarized quite well in the Debian release mantra, which is we release when it's ready, which actually means that for us what is most more, more important is the, the quality of the packages rather than some artificial deadline you might want to put on your release cycle. And so when I told you before that on the weekend of uh, February 5th and 6th we are going to release Debian Squeeze, well, we hope we're going to do that, and I'm quite confident we will, but if the day before that we will find uh, some release blocker, well, rest assured that we will not release and fix that before being able to release. So this is the first point, package quality. The second point is, uh, well, maybe quite obvious, but it is freedom. And here I mean software freedom. Because the social contract is still in effect and guarantees that uh, there is a specific tie based on specific um, software freedom principles that tie together users and developers. And we have been doing that. We have been promoting the culture of free software since 1993. And you, Debian is free the bottom up. What does that mean? Well, all the software that you get via Debian, it's free. Freedom um, firmware included started with squeeze. We moved away all the non-free uh, firmware bits from the kernel to non-free. So by default in Debian you will get only 100% free, free software. But not only that, also the infrastructure we use to make Debian is completely free software. So in Debian no one will accept to, um, to give users tools to do bug reports for instance which are not free. Nobody in Debian will accept to use a, a piece of our infrastructure like a build daemon which is not free. This is really not acceptable. And users in general are aware of this choice of ours and are happy about them. Uh, and trust Debian not to betray those principles of free software that are written in our social contract. And all this in the ecosystem has a role of setting a very high bar for free software advocates. So Debian is a kind of a benchmark. If you see if you can do better or not than Debian in defending software freedom, well, this is an important role that Debian still play. Third reason is independence. And I care a lot about this. So what, is, what, what does it mean to be an independent project like Debian? Well, there is no single company which is actually behind Debian. So we don't, Debian is a, is a community distribution, but it's not associated to any single company. That means that all our means are donations of hardware or of money. Sometimes they come from company, but they came from different companies. And most of the time came from users which actually want to support Debian and donate money to us. And everything else is a gift economy based on exchange of work among volunteers. Um, this is very much remarkable. So think at all the... I use the term mainstream distribution, which is not really uh, meaningful, but imagine the most popular distribution you can find out there. Well, most of them are one way or another run by companies or supported by companies, by specific companies. Debian is not the same. In Debian, we are very much more independent from the need of gaining money of some company. And that means that people trust Debian choices not to be driven by profit. Fourth and last a reason why Debian does it better is decision making. So a lot of people make fun of the way Debian make decisions, but it's not true that we vote on every single thing, actually. Uh, the basic criteria for deciding in Debian is what I like to call a duocracy. So a duocracy means that if you're doing something, if you are responsible for something, as long as you work on it, you are free to decide to do whatever you want on that specific project area. Usually it is a package. So if you're responsible for a package, you can do whatever you want as long as you are working on it. Okay? And the second point, which is a second class way of making decision, is democracy. So when that fades, when there are conflicts, well, we might want to resort to democracy to take decision by, by a vote in the project. So what does that mean? Well, that reputation in the project follow works. Uh, 
So if you are someone well known in the project, that means that you are doing a lot of work for the well-being of the project. It means that there is no benevolent dictator in the project, not even me, I'm just a kind of coordinator of activities which happen in the project. And there are no imposed decisions by who has money, by who has the infrastructure, or by who is employing people to work on Debian. So, this is a first argument for me to say that uh, you should care about Debian because it plays a very important role in the free software ecosystem. And so I think that Debian should live long and prosper. Uh, freedom and independence are very good. And I'm kind of scared at thinking at a distribution market in which every single distribution is run by companies. Because one day, their interest will clash with our interest. And we have seen recently the example of companies which used to be very good friends of free software, changing their mind on being bought by other companies and not being very good friends of free software anymore. Every reference to recent event is completely, uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, science fiction, I would dare to say. Um, and also, having Debian around is a kind of, uh, is set a good example, even for a distribution run by company, to actually invite those company to enable every passing day more and more their distribution to run their own boat. Okay, so this was my first argument for um, the relevance of Debian. The second one, if you are a more prag pragmatic type of guy, type of people, it's um, Debian is at the root of a high tree of derivative distributions. So what is a derivative? Well, a derivative is essentially a, so a very big software project in which you apply software freedom to a whole distribution. So you take an existing distribution, you add some packages, you change something, you patch whatever you want to patch, and you rebuild your own package, and periodically you sync with your uh, mother distribution. So this is the idea of a, of a derivative distribution. And derivatives have changed the, the game of software distribution in the past, I would say, 10 years. Because with derivatives, the focus of a software project uh, moves to customization. So all the people power you will need in your derivative distribution will be on customizing it for your specific goal. Everything else you can reuse from the distribution you, you descend from. Uh, and if this is done properly, that is very good. Everybody wins. Why? Well, derivative gain a lot in terms of work they can reuse. Okay? This is a clear advantage. And the so-called mother distro gains a lot in terms of the public it can reach out to via the derivative distribution. And this is true both for users you can reach out to and also for contributors you might be able to get. So the idea of derivative distribution is very, is very good. Uh, and Debian has been, chosen, has been chosen as a mother distribution, let's say, for a lot of derived distribution. So if you look at uh, Distal Watch, you will find like uh, 120 distribution which have been based on Debian. Some of them are not alive anymore, but those that I report here are essentially all uh, alive and kicking. And so that shows that Debian is a nice choice of a base if you want to create your own derivative. So why it is so? Well, first of all, you have quite some guarantee on the packages, like your guarantee of quality and you have guarantee of licensing assurance. So all the review work which has been done on those packages by Debian is something you can reuse from, for free. This is the beautiful of free software after all. Um, and then you have a very solid based system. You have a lot of packages. So we have seen like 30,000 packages in Debian. And finally, Debian is not necessarily customized for any specific use. So we call it the universal operating system, meaning that we try to address various kinds of needs, trying to be not to be too specific on any of them. So it means that these are very good base for customization. So starting from Debian, you have quite some freedom in customizing it for your specific need. Uh, let's see as a specific example. So there is a, this minor distribution you might have heard of called uh, Ubuntu. And uh, its distribution started in 2004 by Canonical. With, uh, initially, was a target user was a desktop user. So the motto was uh, Linux for human beings. And they've been, they've been very successful in that. And it's a Debian derivative. It's very popular. So if you look at uh, popularity contest data, it seems that the, they have something like 10 times the user base of uh, Debian. So, uh, there, it's very difficult to count the number of users of a software project because on that basis it is something like that. Uh, 
Historically, there have been a division in Maine and Universe in Ubuntu, with the, the main part being worked on mainly by the, let's say, like the corporation part, but it's more blurry than that, and the Universe part being worked on by the community. And um, it's heavily customized in the main part of the distribution. Actually, they have quite some packages which have been forked from Debian, so the package is completely different. And it's very much more close to Debian in the universe part. And on the right, you see the number of packages which populate an Ubuntu release. So this is for, I think, links, but they haven't changed substantially after that. Uh, so you see that three quarters of the archive, 74%, are unmodified Debian packages. You have like 18% of packages which are Debian packages patched, and then which then become part of the Ubuntu distribution. And then you have a 7% of packages which are packages which are not packaged in Debian, and which ends up in Ubuntu. So uh, this is a representative example in terms of uh, how a derivative works. So there are quite a lot of packages which come directly from the distribution you choose to base your work on. But it's this part, so the part which came unmodified from Debian, is way higher in other derivative distribution. So, and that's normal. If they have less people power to customize the distribution, they tend to have more, pa more unmodified Debian packages. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you are running a Debian derivative, or a derivative of a derivative, or a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, well, the chances are that you very much depend on Debian. And this is so even if your, your distribution don't tell you, doesn't tell you so. So this is a second reason why you should care about Debian, because like it or not, you depend a lot on the work which is being done on Debian. So the question is how we can make all this sustainable, fun, and useful for free software in general, and for all involved parties. Well, the situation is getting worse. So people are starting to, to create a derivative distribution from Ubuntu, and it is just normal that it is the case. And uh, what, does, what this mean is that we are, we are seeing today a new way of distributing software to, to people. And uh, it's what I call the, a new software distribution pipeline. So since a few years ago, it was something like this. So we used to have upstream software author on the left. Then we have some in-between distribution, like Debian or Red Hat or any other distribution which was there like 10 to 15 years ago. And then we had the uh, users on the right. And there was a kind of uh, double flow of information from one direction into the, and the other. So from left to right, you see software, which flows from who creates the software to users on the right. And in the other direction, you have bug report and patches. And now the thing has changed dramatically, and we have way more uh, in, in between links. So you have different distribution which use the work from each other, and at every single step in that chain, every single link in that chain, you can have users. Okay? That is wonderful, because we get way, way more users than we were able to get before. So at every single link, you might get new users, because you have customized the distribution for a specific need, which wasn't addressed before. And we have more highballs, which are able to swallow more bugs. And we have also a lot more potential contributors. So at each single link, we might get potential contributor. But we must be very careful, because all this must be sustainable for every single link in the chain, and uh, should benefit free software as a whole. Because I don't know if what is the case for you, but in Debian, we do this not for the benefit of Debian, but in general, for the benefits of free software. So that is what we care about. Uh, so what are my, let's say, golden rules for making all this sustainable? So the first, of, of, the first of, it, of them is keeping in mind that free software is actually bigger and more important than every single link in that chain. Uh, is more important than Debian, is more important than Ubuntu, is more important than every derivative distribution or every single project out there. And then the two rules are that at each single link in the chain, we should care about giving back. Because if we don't give back a single patch which is contributed in a specific link, well, then that, that contribution is lost. It stays there, and it doesn't flow up to the left, and it does not benefit other people. And the second point is giving credit. So paying attention that uh, users are very much aware of where the work they benefit from comes from. And this is true at every single level. It's true also for Debian. They should be very careful in explaining to their users where the free software they use comes from. 
Um, so, summarizing, there was three main messages I had to, uh, to tell you in this talk. So, my main argument is that you should care about Debian for two reasons. The first one is that it plays a very important role in the free software ecosystem and is kind of remaining one of the very few distributions doing that. And um, Debian is also the root of a huge tree of uh, derivative distribution, and all of them benefit from work being done in Debian. So if you are a user of one of these distribution, you, you benefit from the work and you should care about the well-being of Debian. And finally, uh, we all need to realize that free software is better served by collaboration and code exchange along those three of derivative distribution. So I try to keep this rather short. So I will welcome every question on these topics or any other Debian-related topic you might have. Thank you. Now, um, I fully agree with you on the importance of Debian, but I'm, I'm thinking what we're seeing now is sort of a, a decline of uh, an actual, an individual Debian release. Um, simply because the the release schedule is a fairly long one, and there's a number of projects that are on su on such quick release cycles, you know, adding uh, features that users really want, um, that by the time a Debian package actually moves to stable, that software is essentially almost obsolete, which has a lot of people ending up, you know if they're actually running Debian, running sort of a hybrid between stable and backports or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, but what you said here, as in Debian being this root of a boatload of other distributions, isn't that something that you should reinforce even more strongly in the public image of Debian? Because I heard you made this point here in this talk, but everything that I've seen in that regard on the Debian website proper was you know, one remark saying Ubuntu is based on Debian. Okay, and so maybe you want to you know, extend that message a little bit further so more people actually get that point. So I agree. Let's start, I start from this last point, which enables me showing the first of two spam slides I have available. So we are actually running right now two initiatives related to that. So starting, I think, six months ago, we created a, what we call the Derivative Found Desk, which is a point where a, a discussion list and a forum and some resources for, for all Debian derivative distribution to actually meet and discuss how to exchange code among them. But what is more in, more in line with what you just said is that we are running right now a census of existing Debian derivative. And this, I think, it would, it's the first step in actually doing what you're proposing. So in communicate more clearly the role of Debian with respect to all these derivatives and being clear about this kind of uh, uh, role Debian is playing. So yes, I totally agree with that. And we are trying to fix this. To fix this. Uh, regarding the first part of your question, so I agree. In fact, what I, I, I'm, what I think is that it's not a single release of um, Debian which is kind of diminishing in importance, but there are a new target of users which not care much about stable releases. So that explains the interest in uh, rolling releases, which is becoming, I have the impression, more and more relevant. So a lot of people are using this kind of distribution. But don't forget that actually Debian has one such rolling release. So actually, I think we have been kind of the first one in having it. It's called testing. It's not meant to be a final user uh, release, but it's actually pretty good. So if you use it on your laptop, you will find that you have a very good mixture of fresh software and software which has been tested a little bit anyhow. So it has been stayed around for at least 10 days without people noticing serious bug in it. So we do have one such release, and I think we should look into how to uh, use it more and how to, how to make it more suitable for final users. So, but I don't think it's, it's actually the, the importance of stable release which have diminished, but more than there is a whole new class of Linux users which cares about this kind of very fresh software. It's something we didn't have, I say, 10 years ago. So, I mean, I disagree that the, 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 this whole thing about the stable release cycle, it is a long cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the history here, it was a one-year cycle up until about midway through, and then it's been so. It's uh, three every, the, the average is two years for the past the four moment, release it's cycles. Two years, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, having worked in an ISP, 
that's actually pretty good. A yep. two-year lease cycle is something that is, is, is reasonably workable, uh, so long as the finished product is pretty stable and you can do your own ports to change just the things you need to do. So uh, Ubuntu has come along and, and, and added their LTS stuff for servers. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether or not a stable release every six months is a goal that we want because other people are doing that. So I, I agree with the, so the fact is that there are different kind of users. So the user you just took as an example, an ISP, is a user which is perfectly served by stable release which came out every two years. And that's fine. Yes, Exactly. So I think we, in the last uh, 10 years, we, we saw an, a rise of desktop user, Linux desktop user. We should be all happy for that, about that. And we just need to figure out how to best address their needs, which are not necessarily the same of stable users. So I completely agree with that. And to some degree, that's fallen out anyway. And yeah. people, people who are prepared to, people who want a desktop are prepared to run testing or unstable are doing it. And if they're not prepared to do that, they're going to use Ubuntu. That's all we've done. Yeah, sure. This is actually more of a comment than a question. I feel that Debian, one thing you've done badly is that you've undersold the testing distribution. Most users can use it. It is perfectly safe, even non-technical people. There's a big blather made about st releases. Everybody beats it up and says, the people say it's taking two years, three years, four years. It really doesn't matter. People can use testing straight away. They don't have to wait for the stable distribution. Y yes and no. So I might agree that we undersold them, but because we, we tend to be conservative in that. We prefer not to tell people that something is pretty good and risking that we eat the corner, which is not that good, than the other way around. So we've chosen to stay on the conservative side and not saying that. But in fact, you are right. Testing is a pretty good distribution, but it has some glitches which make it not yet suitable for final users. For instance, you have no guarantee that you'll have a Debian installer which is working every single day to install Debian testing. So it might happen that in a specific day you try to install Debian testing and you're not able to do that because the release of Debian installers is not in sync with the testing distribution. So there is some interest in fixing that. So there is an internal project in which some people have interest which is called CAT, constantly usable testing. It's not something we have committed to release or anything yet, but there is interest in doing that. And the idea of that project is actually fixing those glitches which make testing a not a suitable distribution every single day. So, yes, it's fairly good, but there are some itches that makes it not yet entirely suitable for every possible use. So, for more corporate market, we still have servers that are Sarge. <laughs> they're not supported. I think we've got about two months before they're pretty much all going to be gone, at least the public ones. But... The Debian release cycle, I mean, one of the things I'm hearing from other people is that the Debian release cycle is too frequent. Of course, using... <laughs> I know. Uh, of course, using um, RHEL as the major example with RHEL 5 was... For, for all the backports might be needed at the end of a Debian release cycle, RHEL 5 has been just about unusable without a similar system as, similarly. So yeah, that was more a comment than a question, I guess. But we have been working on trying to have some sort of LTS support for Debian as well. So it's not there yet for Squeeze, but the security team is working on that. And uh, right now, the, secu the security um, lifetime you could expect for a Debian distribution is something like three year and a half. So this is the time span you can expect right now. So to reach levels of other LTS distribution, we just need to add one year and a half of support. And we are actually working on that, although it's not there yet. I mean, this is all sort of funny to me because when um, RHEL first hit the market, one of my comments to one of my counterparts at Red Hat was, oh, you finally figured out how to do a stable release. And <laughs> It really is sort of interesting. There's this dynamic tension all the time. And what you find is anytime somebody is building or deploying a new system, they always want the latest, freshest, greatest bits because they know that once it goes into production and it's locked down, they won't be able to touch it again forever. And so the idea of going out the door based on something that isn't 
reasonably fresh. I mean, you want some confidence in it, but if it isn't reasonably fresh, it feels like you're sort of behind the curve before you even start. On the other hand, once it's out, you really do want this really long extended support cycle if you can get it. And so this is the thing that I think every distribution struggles with. And it's why I've been so intrigued in watching the set of Debian derivative distributions to see which ones sort of bias and in, in different One directions. direction or the other. Yeah, yeah. because I, I think at the end of the day, it's probably always going to be impossible to make everybody completely happy. But it's intriguing that, you know, there's so many of us with very different objectives who all sort of find some sweet spot to live in, in and around the Debian ecosystem. Thanks, Peter. I'd just like to clarify something here. Um, in my humble opinion, it's not just the users, it's also the relationship that Debian has with their respective upstream projects. Um, Debian relies very, very heavily on fixes from upstream, even though there's a security team working on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Red Hat or Novell, for their long-term distributions, they can pay people to fix bugs in the software. Debian doesn't have that luxury, so it strongly relies on upstream to to you know to fix issues and if you have an upstream project that says well folks you're using a branch that we've considered obsolete for a year and a half then Debian has a bit of a problem and that's just something that needs to be addressed of course if you have like a, a, a derivative distribution that caters to this and that perhaps even does have a commercial organization behind it that can pay people to fix these things then great but I think Debian by itself has a hard time kind of delivering on that sort of expectation so I agree, but this for me is, is the real challenge. Yeah. So uh, as I said in the beginning of the talk, we are kind of one of the few remaining community distro among the most popular distribution. And, this, and we are completely volunteer driven, and this for me is a real challenge. Whether we can you know, face or not the, the market with this difference that we, not, we, can, we don't have the luxury of paying people. This is quite exciting, but you know what? I think that overall we are doing pretty well. Because, I mean, the Debian maintainers know the software they are packaging, and so they can maintain some code, backport fixes, or this kind of stuff. Of course, it's not the same uh, firepower of uh, big companies, but considering the difference, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, I have uh, two things to say. Uh, first is a compliment. I actually like that I always know what state that Debian is in, regardless of what I install or what I uninstall it usually always goes back to a relatively stable state, even in testing, which is fantastic. Not many other distributions are able to stick Thanks. to that. I'll forward the comment to the Debian community. How, however, I, uh, on that topic of the uh, testing, I was wondering if it was possible to perhaps um, have a, a couple supported, so you could perhaps do a yearly release um, based, on, um, based on the testing software, and once it's been tested for a while in that somewhat stable testing release it can then go from the somewhat stable to the very stable if people really so want I to So I start observing stable, that stable. stable testing is kind of oxymoron. But <laughs> it sort of is, but you get what I'm saying. But yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. And in fact, in, in, within the discussion of this CAT project, which is being going on, there are two models which are being proposed and which are being evaluating. One model is a purely rolling distribution in which you just need to fix some glitches of the testing distribution. And another one is the idea of taking periodic snapshots. So finding some, way, some moment in which you have some guarantees out of the current testing, you take a snapshot of that, and six months later you take another snapshot. So that's, what? Because 10 days is not long. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, but, so that's kind of one of the idea which is being discussed, but it's not there yet. So if you're testing into that, you might, be, you might want to join the initiative because we, we pretty much need people that are willing to look into that. And you know, having an impact in Debian is quite easy after all. You just need to show that you're able to do things and you will, you will be able to have an impact on the project. Thank you. Hi. Um, Where is it? Yep. Okay. Hi. Um, I realize it's um, a bit of old history at this point, but the open SSL issue that Debian had a couple of years back now, um, as Debian becomes more of a, well, there are more downstream distributions pulling from Debian and bugs like that can affect downstream users. I'm just wondering what sort of in infrastructure there is in place for downstream distros and users to um, 
address that? So the, the problem on that, is, so there is not much uh, infrastructure in place. The infrastructure we have is that all our services are open and usually have some sort of standardized interface, so it's relatively easy to hack and use them. The problem in that respect is that among all the um, derivative distribution we have had based on Debian, the only very big one is Ubuntu. So the first Mm, the first moment in which this problem of which inf interface we use among the two is, is, has arrived only with Ubuntu. So we are facing now the problem that we need to make things work well on, at that boundary and maybe figure out together with other derivative distribution how to make things work better for them. So this is exactly what we're trying to do with the derivative front desk, but it's in some sense it is a novel problem. Because thus far, the other distribution were kind of 99% relying on Debian and modifying 1% of package, and they just kept the changes and didn't care about that. Because there was no real need to, to actually interchange much code. They were just pulling and not really pushing back. So this is kind of a novel problem we are trying to uh, attack right now. Hi. My question is along the similar lines. Um, what's being done to ensure that um, bugs and that make their way upstream, having all these derivatives of derivatives and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's been a kind of a interesting situation once more with the, in the relationship with Ubuntu because we have been, because complaining that we are not giving back to us and that made us realize that maybe we were not doing everything properly ourselves with respect to Spring. So that's a pretty exciting time in which you need to realize that every single link in that chain should do the same and should adhere to pushing changes back to upstream. Regarding what we have done, we have been doing practically, well, for us it's a standard practice to forward bugs upstream. So it's nothing novel, it's something we have always been uh, doing. And then, of course, you, you have no guarantee that every single maintainer is going to do that, but the, let's say the social pressure for doing that is there. Is absolutely there. Yeah, that's true. Uh, one on, at your right. Can I just offer my congratulations to yourself and any other Debian contributors in the room on the um, the work that's been done to remove non-free software from the kernel? It's fantastic achievement. So, and also you. to those which are not in the room. And by the way, this is a very nice example of collaboration with Upstream. So the Debian kernel team has been working for like the past two or the, actually three release cycle in doing that. So we were being kind of hammered by others saying, look, you're not putting away bits from uh, the kernel non-free bits. <coughs> but okay, we made exception for two release cycles, but the kernel team especially has kept on working on that together with Upstream kernel, and now it's done. So it's been a very nice example. Yeah, let me also say a word of thanks for the update mechanism which you put in place, which makes it the, possible the for update? the updating mechanism oh. app which you put in place makes it possible for somebody non-technical like me to update for 12 years and have nothing broken at all. <laughs> Questions? a bit of a noob question. Can, is there any way you could just quickly describe what the upstream projects look like? like um, what do you mean the upstream project? Well, is, is it... Ah, the upstream. upstream yeah, yeah. So that's, that's something which I'm really excited about as well. So that's an initiative run, um, started by um, some open SUSE people, in particular by Vincent Onth. I'm not sure I can pronounce it properly, which actually I met at some free software conference a few months ago, and he said, you know what, we have been trying to do some cross-distro work on uh, application installer. So meaning the package manager, but some kind of package manager which is more suited for final users. So a kind of package manager which is which has the granularity of applications rather than a granularity of packages. Like, I want Inkscape. I don't care if it is split in three packages, I don't care if I need to install a library or something like that. Something like Software Center, which we have in Debian, which is in Ubuntu. And so the idea was to work on that and to actually try to do that in a collaborative manner across different distribution so that we can share package metadata, like screenshots, like tags, are all stuff that can be easily shared among different distributions. So what happened is that they had a meeting, and the meeting was attended by people from Debian, from Ubuntu, from Magia, from OpenSUSE, and so on and so forth. And they worked on that. They adopted quite some Debian technology, like uh, uh, 
uh, apt Xabian index like dabdags like uh, screenshot Debian net and they are doing to create a software project put, pulling together those technologies and technology from other distribution to actually have a, uh, let's say a user interface for package selection which is suitable for end users and which tries to share data from all distributions so that's kind of the idea and it's pretty exciting, not only the idea, but actually the way in which it has been worked on in a cross-distribution manner. To, my, to the best of my memory, it's the first large-scale example of cross-distribution collaboration. <coughs> so it's pretty exciting. I have, sorry, just one spam slide remaining. So if everything goes well, we are nine days from the release of Debian Squeeze, and on the Debian Wiki you will find a list of release parties, and one is missing in Brisbane. So, well, I'm sure you'll agree that it's uh, great to have such an authoritative uh, speaker on such an influential topic. So, join with me to thank Stefan. <laughs> <laughs>